Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Now, you may recall that about a year ago, we had Tracy Flanagan on the show. And Tracy is the co-founder of J-Dog Brands, a junk removal and hauling franchise organization for military veterans and spouses turned entrepreneur. Some exciting news that I wanted to share with you is that J-Dog has been picked up for a television series on Discovery Channel and the American Heroes Channel. And I bet you didn't even know that that channel existed. I know I did not. Now, the show is called Operation Hidden Treasures, and it follows two veteran teams from J-Dog junk removal and hauling as they haul away loads of unwanted items from homes and businesses, then transform those into necessities, keepsakes, and valuables for people in need. How cool is that? So congratulations to Tracy and J-Dog Brands. And in the spirit of continuing to support our active military, our veterans, and their families, that brings us to today's show. My guest today is Ralph Galati, Executive Director of the J-Dog Foundation, which provides leadership support, awareness, and funding to veterans organizations that rebuild and repair homes and lives for veterans. Ralph, welcome to the show. Great. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. Now, before we get into our conversation, I want to share a little bit more about Ralph to everybody out there, because that title that I just gave really does not truly reflect who you are, everything you've done for all of us as individuals and for our country overall. And it warrants a little bit of telling. So indulge me for just a moment here. And for everybody listening, as I explain this, there should not be any question in your mind about how this relates to leadership or communication. And we'll dig into all of that in just a moment. Now, Ralph, uh, correct me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you started out in the Air Force flying jets in 1971 in the middle of the Vietnam War, correct? Correct, yes. And your plane was shot down and you were captured and served as a prisoner of war for 14 months, along with none other than John McCain before being released and repatriated to the U.S. Again, correct? Correct. So that is just, you know, how often do you speak with someone who has had such an experience and lived to tell about it and made such amazing service over there? And we'll talk about how much you've done with all of that as well since then. But in the 10 years uh, of your military career, to say that you were decorated as a hero is an understatement. So to everybody out there, Ralph has received the Purple Heart, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Air Medal, and the Air Force Commendation Medal, and all of which had more oak leaf clusters than most of my backyard. So this is more than just somebody who, all veterans are amazing. This is somebody who has clearly demonstrated leadership uh, and sacrifice in a way that is undeniable. And since then, Ralph's career spanned 28 years at IBM, a stint with SAP, followed by uh, also as a as adjunct faculty for 30 years, I believe, at St. Yes, Joseph's yeah, University. Exactly where you ultimately served as the head of the Office of Veteran Services at St. Joe's University. Right. And you've also been serving on a bunch of, of boards, now in particular heading the J-Dog Foundation, as I mentioned earlier. So before I forget, on behalf of our listeners and our country at large, thank you for your incredible sacrifice and ongoing service. Well, it was an honor to serve. Thank you. Now, let's get down to our conversation. Uh, let's focusing on J-Dog uh, foundation in particular, tell us a little bit about the organization. What's your 30-second elevator pitch? Well, Jerry and Tracy founded it a couple of years ago. Uh, it's designed primarily with two missions. One is to offer uh, a point of contact for veterans and families in need, especially in the area of suicide prevention and PTSD support. Uh, we're not clinicians, but we can point them to help. And then we're also providing some education grants for veterans uh, that, are in, that are in college. Not everybody qualifies for the GI Bill or for the full extent of the GI Bill. And we're trying to help some veterans in need to make sure that they could progress toward their degree. So important. So anybody out there who is a veteran or knows a veteran, make sure that they reach out and take a look at J. Doug. And we'll give website links and things at the end of the show uh, to make sure that people are and actually getting all the services that they most definitely have earned and deserve. Great. What's your favorite part of your job and why? Uh, the last 10 years since my retirement has been uh, just helping veterans, uh, either to the foundations that I'm on the board with or, or in public speaking. Um, you never know what you might say that might put a veteran or a family member on a good path or give them some encouragement or encourage them to ask for help, which is usually the biggest challenge. So 
uh, professing support for veterans, but actually by by doing the work. So it's one thing to thank somebody for their service, another one to take them by the hand and guide them through the process. So that's been really rewarding, I think, in my last 10 years of doing veteran service related work. Mm, talk about knowing that you're making a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what's something that is coming up or something that's exciting that's going on within the organization or maybe not uh, that it could be happy and positive or challenging that's well, coming up that that you want to make sure that the messaging sure. is clear around uh, and, and veterans work is is ongoing uh, as far as the jdog foundation uh you, they're going to have they're going to have this uh, program start in december in uh, october operation hidden treasures uh, one of the byproducts of that is during every during every episode uh, they're going to be auctioning off an item of some value that they found as part of hmm. these hidden treasures and the proceeds from that is going to go to the j-dog foundation which will then help veterans and family members in need um, and then with the closing of activities in iraq and afghanistan in the middle east uh, for the most part hopefully we'll see more veterans coming back maybe leaving service becoming civilians again and it's important that we capture them as early as we can becoming civilians and making sure we get them uh, the help and benefits and services that they have rightfully deserved. And that's a, that's a, a term of, of irony in there as far as capturing them as early as possible, right? We want to make sure that, we, that we're serving them, that we're, we're catching them and uh, making sure that they are landing with a bit of a safety net. The, so I think that's important too, because it's not just with all the veterans who are coming home, all the active service members who may be getting ready to, to leave the military as they come back from Afghanistan and from elsewhere, that there's a much better chance now that anybody out there who is not a veteran may be working with one mm -hmm. or otherwise will encounter them, whether it's in your community organizations, in your uh, religious organizations, and you may just meet them. They may move in next door to you. You never know right. where you're going to uh, suddenly encounter a recently repatriated uh, veteran of one form or another. So to uh, we're going to talk today about some of the things that may help you, but if nothing else, I want to make sure that people out there are aware and just feel a little bit more prepared, not just to be able to, you know, be a nice neighbor to a veteran, which of course is always important, but also just to, to have the radar go up to a few things that you should know or ways that you can serve in return. Well, there's only a couple degrees of separation for any citizen of this country between you and knowing somebody that's a veteran. Yeah. Uh, and, and you just mentioned it. It could be a family member, but it also could be a neighbor or somebody in your church or the soccer team. Um, aside from saying thanks for your service, you should really then say in your face, uh, are you getting your veterans benefits? Mm. And more than half the time, they're going to say no, uh, at which point you get back in their face and insist that they do and find a local uh, veteran service officer, or it could be just somebody in the VFW or the AMVETS or just somebody that you know in the neighbor or Ralph Galati. Uh, and make sure they get that smooth handoff because there's any number of benefits between health benefits, education, home mortgages, um, insurance. Uh, there are benefits that they have rightfully earned, that they rightfully deserve. Uh, they're just a little bit reluctant often at times to think that they uh, should get them. So I think it's incumbent on us to, to take that uh, action on their behalf. I appreciate that. And, and sure. so we're going to touch a little bit more on that. I think I'm going to bring that one up later on when we get to our 24 hour influence challenge. So let's hold that thought too. So right. I want to play with that a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit about the leadership communication skills that you feel like the military uniquely helps people to develop. Leadership is an interesting, it's one of the half a dozen or so soft skills that I think most employers crave uh, that veterans don't presume that they have very much skill in. Uh, unless you're a military officer and have led a unit, uh, you don't see it. But almost every enlisted person has had an opportunity to lead a small group, a small platoon, a small team into some kind of action, whether it's combat or not. Uh, leadership is built into the military uh, discipline and military psyche. Um, I just don't think like a, like a bunch of other skills that most military people feel that it is worth uh, highlighting. So it's hard to put uh, co your communication skills or your risk management skills or the discipline and leadership that you've had in the military quantify it successfully in a resume to make it a great attribute 
as you become a civilian again. But it is instinctive. It is built in. Uh, it's something that every employer craves because it's hard to teach. Uh, the, uh, the communication skill is a little different. Um, probably more effective uh, from an officer because they have to uh, lead a larger group of people. Uh, but communication skills I have found over my years in the military and business and teaching uh, is a hard skill to develop, both written communications and oral communication. So uh, while it, I don't find it unique to the military, it just might be a little bit more difficult for them to transition successfully from military talk to civilian talk. So I, I'm gonna, I wanna address both of those. You actually just touched on two really important pieces there. So the first is that you said that military people often don't feel like the leadership experience that they had in the military is worth highlighting in the civilian world, whether I assume you mean in on resumes or in job interviews or elsewhere. Why do you think that is? I think there's this small suite of soft skills. Uh, leadership is one, being mission focused, uh, being able to adapt to pretty disruptive change, taking risks, being part of a team, communicating successfully, not, not I mean communicating to each other successfully. Mm -hmm. Those skills uh, are intrinsic to the military. They don't necessarily say today we're going to have a lecture on risk management. It's just by, by your very actions at times, you are asked to do some out-of-the-box thinking. Even though the military is very structured at times, sometimes you have to adapt to the environment. Uh, those attributes are hard to quantify. They're hard to put on a resume other than in bullet form. So when they're when a veteran leaves the military and transitions, those skill sets that I think are extremely valuable to an employer because I can teach you to be an accountant, I can teach you to be an HR professional. I can't tell you how to think dynamically and adapt mm. to change. Military people tend to come with that. They just don't know it often enough okay. uh, because it's not necessarily part of their curriculum. It's just instinctive. So unless it's brought out or unless you focus on it, I think it gets buried. That's interesting. So it, it's not that maybe a better way to put it and tell me if I'm understanding what I'm hearing you say correctly, that it's not that they don't feel like their leadership skills are worth highlighting. It's that they almost don't know how to label them or how to even identify mm -hmm. them when it's been when it's been done so in such an integrated mm -hmm way, whether they're talking about risk management skills or right. or crisis control or something along those along those lines, all of those skills that you just listed are sort of part and parcel of the package. And they're just right. learned in the moment as opposed to here's a course on this, here's a lecture on that, right. here's so without having had those separate conversations or those those skills and, and knowledge sets, et cetera, labeled they don't think about them as be in the disaggregated form in a way that would allow it to even be listed on a on a resume. So they don't know how to express the nature of what their skills are. Am I understanding that correctly? As always, Laura, you said it much better than I did. <laughs> That's exactly right. It, it, it's it's part of the package. It's just uh, it's it's hard to delineate them individually. It's just part of the package that you get. You're exactly right. Okay, so for those out there then who are military, recognize. I hope you're listening to this and uh, have can start to think about how to break down the experiences and the trainings that you've had into what kinds of labels to to use because you do have a lot of experience to share mm -hmm. and that people need to know so they can give you the opportunities that you deserve and want and are ready for. Uh, but also to those out there who are perhaps in HR um, doing interviews uh, or bosses out there who have hired veterans, you may not realize that the person that you're talking to has a lot of these skills, but has never express them per se, because they've never known really how. So perhaps asking better questions, asking more specific questions, asking more scenario-based questions, um, and there's different kinds of interviewing structures per se that, that facilitate that or that, that use those approaches, uh, people can give the examples rather than give the labels. And then it's right. going to be up to you to label for yourself what they do or don't have. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a little hard to extract it. it it's a little more work to get the veteran to talk about those. But I think uh, uh, to use the J Dog example, they are hidden treasures. They are yes. assets. They are assets that are available uh, that you really, as a, as a civilian employer, you really want to get them and leverage them because there'll be a value to your company. Right, right. Now, are there, are there other 
common communication skills challenges that members of the armed service face when they're reintegrating into civilian life and uh, trying to start over with regular civilian jobs? Yeah, it's it's getting rid of the jargon. I mm. mean, the military is heavy acronym oriented and jargon oriented and crude at times. Mm. Uh, and so getting out of that, uh, I still have some veterans that I talk to that it's like talking to them back in the 60s. They mm. remember their call sign. They remember their mission. They like to use the slang and the vernacular. Um, you know, at, at some point, it's time to like grow up and move on. Mm. <laughs> and for young folks today, um, they have to realize one of the challenges is becoming to be coming back to a civilian world again is difficult enough uh, and and appreciating the fact that the civilian world doesn't understand your slang mm. and you have to understand the new slang or basically become an american citizen again mm. so communication is a little bit difficult because uh it, it's it's like hiring a medical professional to be a business leader. They have their unique set of language. Lawyers have their unique set of language. The militaries is very unique as well. So uh, I think getting that out and, and causing them to, to uh, be more civilian speak is a little bit of a challenge, yeah. It, the irony is that I think this is something that anybody who has spent a lot of time in one industry or in one world, whether it's military or academia or you know, hospitals or, or anything like that, you get used to a particular speaking style. I know for myself as a, what I like to call myself a recovering academic uh, after also teaching in the university for a decade or so uh, and research and all that kind of stuff, you learn to speak like an academic and then you get into the business world and people go, could you does every word have to have six syllables in it? Because it's really kind of boring and tiresome. <laughs> Could you just, you know, talk like a human and you go, yeah. oh, okay. So what they spent 10 years beating into my skull, I now have to completely unlearn and relearn how to just talk like a person. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. Great. And unless you're on a college campus, you don't hear the word lexicon or dialectic very often. <laughs> but, but that's the same thing. I mean, the yes. military folks are used to a certain lingo, um, but the real word doesn't talk that way. Now, one of the topics that I like to address is the issue of style shifting and authenticity and the ability to know your audience and, and adjust your approach one way or another, the ability to get through to different audiences. Did you find that when you shifted from military to civilian that you had to learn to speak differently to, you know, you mentioned things like jargon and whatnot, but that you had to change the way that you approached people. And, and was it difficult to adapt? So, so the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, coming out of the military, uh, you know, we were toxic. Vietnam veterans were toxic. Um, we generally didn't put down our military service on our resume. We certainly didn't put down we were combat guys on our resume. Uh, a lot of companies just didn't want to deal with veterans. We were painted with a very broad brush, the same brush that you painted the government and the DOD and the war. Uh, whereas today, uh, you might hate all those things, but at least you respect the service member. We didn't have that issue in the 60s and 70s. So we had to bury our military experience and try to become civilians right away at the expense of leveraging or being proud of our military experience. Mm. Today, I think uh, employers as well as veterans know and appreciate the fact that uh, they have something to contribute. Although I think younger people, younger veterans today still feel a little bit that they have to bury their military experience to become successful civilians again. Why do you think that's, that is? That's a little disappointing. Why do you think that is? I think it's just they want to readapt. This whole issue of transition and readjustment is hard on them, especially those that have been with deployments several times. Uh, I think they feel that when they come home, uh, their support structure that they used to have, the brotherhood that they have left in the military, the support structure they used to have, their friends and neighbors, they're gone. They've gone about their lives. They've been married. They've relocated. They've gone to college. They have jobs. They're not around to hang around mm. in the bars where you used to. Whatever you did has moved on. And for you to be able to move on, you better adapt quickly to that new world. So I think sometimes they feel like to become those civilians again, uh, they have to bury a little bit, even though they're proud of it, but bury that military side of them and become civilians again. 
And it's interesting because when typically people who find or the the groups of people <clears throat> from whom I hear the greatest struggles with regard to being able to shift your speaking, your communication style from audience to audience and still manage that feeling of authenticity are typically women or minorities or you know, other particular demographic groups. So to hear that, uh, you know, from I want people out there to understand that this is something that many people of all different backgrounds also experience in different capacities. And, you know, as, as a male, as a Caucasian, as someone who's not a millennial, who's et cetera, this is um, the notion of having to bury part of your identity that was your driving force, your yeah. your military yeah. service as, as, a, as a patriot, as a service member, et cetera. And now to feel like you, you can't acknowledge that, you can't talk about it you can't be proud of it publicly etc that must yeah, have been well, very no, difficult nobody, for you nobody understands me yeah you gotta realize military we only make up we're less than one percent of the population mm. so there's 99 percent out there that have had no experience with us and and like i said it's not an issue of pride it's just an issue of a lot of them coming back and having trouble readjusting you know to family life and transitioning sure. to become civilian uh, it, it's a little bit foreign to them, especially if they've been in the military for 20 years. Um, so I, I just I just see it a little bit too often that uh, it's it's not easy to talk to a family member civilian about your military experience, especially if it's been in combat and you're carrying a lot of baggage. Mm. Uh, they don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about it. It doesn't get talked about. about. Mm. So, and of course, these are part of the services that J Dog Foundation helps veterans to find so that they can talk about it and they don't have to bury it and they don't have to just bottle it up and, and not contend with all that that brings along. Am I, is that correct? I agree. Yeah. And, and it's hard enough getting a job or getting through college without having that baggage with you. So, right. If you could talk to somebody, it, it's not going to necessarily be us because we're not clinicians, but we could point you to some great organizations who's there to uh, give you an outlet. Uh, it could just be talking with other veterans sometimes. You know, you don't have to sever those ties entirely. And that's this is going to bring us right back to that uh, the, our listener 24 hour influence challenge that you touched on earlier. And I want to revisit a little bit more expressly here. This is the the uh, opportunity to talk directly to the audience, Ralph, and to challenge people to take one step that they can complete mm -hmm. within 24 hours to have more influence in some way, shape or form. Now, you referenced earlier about if you encounter a veteran in any capacity, whether you just sort of see them standing at a bus stop or you are working with them in the cubicle next to them, whatever it happens to be, what do you want people to do? Uh, take action. That's the that's the single biggest thing. Uh, thank them for their service. If you know they're in the military or if, or if they're a veteran, and sometimes your neighbor could be still active. They could be in the guard or reserve. Um, and there's challenges not just for them, but for their family members. Um, I would ensure a simple question, which is, are you getting all your veterans benefits? I don't. You don't even have to know what they are. You just have to ask them if they're getting them. More than half of the people you talk to are going to say no, uh, in which case you have my permission to smack them around a bit and challenge them. <laughs> And, metaphorically, and metaphorically, 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 yeah, or, or physically, uh, and, and insist that they do it, uh, even if you have to uh, do more than encourage, even if you have to help them take some action. Uh, every county in Pennsylvania and in most counties across the country has an Office of Veteran Services that is funded by the government. That's one place you can go. Uh, every community probably has a VFW or an AMVETS or an American Legion post. That's some place you can go. Uh, if you know somebody like me that's in your community that does veterans related work, that's where you can go. Uh, make that connection for them and encourage them or even force them to take some action. Uh, some of them might need um, counseling. Uh, they could all use medical coverage. Uh, they ought to know what their benefits are for education. Uh, there are spouse benefits. There are children's benefits. Uh, they have earned the right to take advantage of every benefit. So you owe it to them to be sure that they take that next step. Okay, so let's let's digest this down into a couple of actionable steps. Number one, I'm hearing the the overall message is contrary to what your parents told you, your teachers told you from the very beginning. Don't mind your own business. Correct. If you are, if you know somebody's a veteran, ask them the question: Are you getting your benefits? Right. You will be doing them a great service, uh, and you'll feel better for it. 
And then now here's where I see people getting stuck. So we're going to script this out for, for, for people, Ralph, that if that you hear the veteran respond to you, no, or I don't know, et cetera, then, so we're not deer in the headlights. What's a good response? Uh, a good response is to the, if they say no, or they don't know, uh, that's the, uh, that's when your antennae ought to go up that says, um, this person is going to need some help. I might have to take it upon myself to actually take an effort. Uh, even though I'm a civilian and I have no idea where to go, it might take an action on your part that says, let me find the phone number for veteran services in Delaware County or Philadelphia or wherever you happen to live. Uh, okay. So uh, that's that would be a good response so that we're not staring. Because what I envision is that people are in these moments and their brain knows conceptually what needs to happen, but their mouth can't find words. And then they sit there and they feel... <laughs> just during the headlights and they, they don't want to get into that position. So they avoid the conversation. We don't right. want that to happen. So we're going to give people a, a giant, uh, you know, we're going to grease the skids real easy for them and give them a response. Somebody says, no, or I don't know it, what I heard, for example, if I'm interpreting you correctly would be to say, then I'll find out what the veterans Correct. affairs line yeah. is for our it's a county based yeah usually yeah. the county bay. Okay. So for your county, whether you're in Alaska or you're in, you know, Nebraska or something that doesn't end in Aska, yeah. <laughs> whatever state you're in, you're going to find the county veterans affairs services hotline yeah. number or otherwise phone number, and you'll provide that for them. Right. That be and, and, and basically what you're going to do is uh, you're going to become a veterans advocate. You're going to help connect the dots and get their name and phone number from the veteran and say, look, I'm going to take this action in your behalf. If I make this connection for you, you know, I, I hope you're going to go. And, and then we're only one step away from, from a resource. Everybody should know somebody in the community that you could ask that says, who do I go to for this? Uh, it's, it's a small effort. It might take you five or 10 minutes or 30 minutes to do it. You'll feel better for it. You've actually now helped the veteran in need. They might not know they're in need, uh, but you're going to be doing yourself a great community service uh, and you'll be helping a veteran. So I, I can't think of anything more worthy than that. Yes. And it's not to say you have to adopt them, that you have to, <laughs> you know, be forever responsible for all of their affairs and all the right. bureaucratic red tape, but make sure that you help them take that first step. Yeah, it's a, it's a small step uh, and you'll feel better for it, but you're, you're right. You're not going to be doing anything more than helping connect the dots. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's talk real quick about mistakes then, Ralph. What's what's a communication mis excuse me, what's a communication related mistake that you've made? How much time do we have, Laura? <laughs> let's pick um, one. Yeah. So one of my biggest failings is <clears throat> I have a heart, my mem I have a, a, a memory issue, and I don't remember people's names and faces very long. So uh, it takes several meetings or a couple of hours to imprint somebody's face so that I remember them. And, and I remember being at an event where I was going to be doing public speaking and we had a social hour at the beginning and I was working around the tables and introducing myself, you know, and I would meet Laura and I would say, hi, we talked for a couple of minutes and I'd go to another table. Well, 15 minutes later, I would come back to your table and reintroduce myself to you again. And, and you give me that look like we just met. You know, I mean, how and, and it would mm. embarrass me and I would embarrass you. And and I felt that that, you know, it's 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 just so inappropriate that I couldn't remember that I just met you. And, and it just like was I not in, was it not important enough that you would remember me 15 minutes ago? And and I, and I really have to work on that today uh, because I know it's a deficiency. I and I know I'll meet people at a speech. And they might say, oh, I heard your speech last year. And they wouldn't expect me to remember them. Mm. But they certainly would expect me to remember them 15 minutes from now. Sure, sure. So I, I, that, that's really, uh, it's disappointing uh, and it's embarrassing. And is there a way that you, so we all have had those mm. moments at some point. You're networking. There's a whole room full of people. You met a bunch of people. And it might be that if not 15 minutes later, it could be a, the next month's yeah. meeting. You reintroduce yourself and you completely forget that the person got a haircut or they are just yeah. wearing very different clothing or you see them out of context. The one time was a networking meeting. The next time is you bump into them at the grocery store, or the baseball game, yeah. or wherever it happens to be. And you're <clears throat> and they introduce themselves to you and you're sitting there staring at them going, do I know you? Do, 
Uh, I you know, we get a little bit of a free pass today with the masks, like a pretend yes. that I don't recognize them with the mask. But, right, right. But not but the it, day. So how do you handle that when you do realize that you've already, you've, you've met before and you're, you have that oops moment, how do you recover? I, I, I just have to tell them that I, I just have to apologize in advance that I, I have an issue. Um, and, and there's some cases where I, I, I might meet somebody like you and I might joke about at the end, this is, look, I'm going to, if I bump into you tomorrow, please don't be offended that I don't remember mm. you, uh, which is a way of me deflecting something that I know is a deficiency on my part. Sure. Uh, but I think I I've always... learned. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think I've learned that um, in, in some cases I have to do a better job because uh, it might embarrass me a little bit, but it's offensive to the other person that I, mm. I haven't given them the courtesy of remembering somebody that I just met. So it's just a skill that I just I have to consciously work on. Sure. You know, I find that uh, I will often tell people after our first meeting, I'll just let them know for whatever reason, it usually takes me three times yeah. before I'm going to remember your name yeah. and that sticks. So by the third time we're good, but just know that there are two more times when I will need to reintroduce myself and I will need to ask you your name. It's yeah. just how my brain works or doesn't work as yeah. the case may be. And they'll usually laugh and, and say something along the lines of commiserating and saying that there's yeah. a similar, so at least mm -hmm. they know. And then when I do do it, I can say, see, I told you now that's number two, it'll be one more. So just yeah. wait for well, it. So you, you can't blame your age, whereas I can blame my age. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure what to blame at this point, but uh, it just makes me concerned about what's going to happen as age continues to, to take. Its I, I have the greatest of intentions, but that's an area that I have a hard time executing on. So well, that's I think the intentions are always the challenge, making yeah, the intention yeah. and the execution match. So finally, <laughs> then, um, actually, one question that I had is with regard to succession planning, what's a common issue that often keeps former service members from getting promotions in corporate America, even if they're technically qualified for those leadership roles? So let's let's put that in perspective first. In the military, um, the first couple of ranks, whether you're an enlisted or an officer, are automatic promotions. Mm. It might be in 18 months, it might be two years or four years. And then after that, you have to vibe for promotions. You have to differentiate yourself. The same thing goes with pay. So if you're a uh, staff sergeant with 10 years in service, you this is your pay, <laughs> period. period. That's what it is. If you're a captain with six years of service, this is your pay. Uh, and you don't negotiate pay. And you and you don't have any... any uh, issue about that. That's very different, obviously, in the civilian world. So uh, a thing that for, for veterans have to realize is, is when you become a civilian, uh, you really have to do a better job of managing your own career. You have to do a better job of selling your value and your worth and differentiating yourself. Uh, you have to be really vocal when it comes time for an appraisal or a promotion or a salary bump. Uh, they're not things that come naturally to military people, especially if you got somebody that served 20 or 30 years, they might be 40 or 50 years old, getting a second career that has never had to ask for money mm. and has has had promotions happen happen to them, not because of them. Right. So it's that, that whole issue is really, really different uh, for veterans in the civilian marketplace. So often they're not there. They don't get promotions because they don't realize they have to ask for them or they don't think that they have to really advocate for themselves uh, to their boss or whoever would be the decision maker. They just your work doesn't speak for itself. There's sort of an yeah, assumption and, that and your work yeah, should speak for yeah, itself. And, you know, and there are at least there used to be annual appraisals that you used to get from your next in command uh, that most people just sat there and listened to somebody mm. tell them how they got appraised mm. as opposed to it being a conversation. Mm. Um, Whereas in today's world, the more conversational, and uh, I remember as I got a little more seasoned, uh, it was easier for me to focus on my areas of deficiency. Like you, you could tell me what a great guy I am. You could tell me the ten things I did really well. Tell me the one or two things that I didn't do well that I could improve on. Mm. Uh, that became important in the civilian world. Maybe not as important in the in the military world. So um, you have to take more direct action. Uh, on the management of your career as a civilian than you maybe did in the military. Got it. So the ability to advocate for oneself and, and to express when you're interested in, in that promotion. So yeah. for those of you out there who are in the military, and of course, this is often cultural values and other things from that are from non-military people also struggle with that. Well, shouldn't my work speak for itself? Shouldn't my boss just recognize that I'm ready? 
the word should is kind of irrelevant. Correct. At a certain point, it does not. If you want to go into a leadership role, you need to start advocating, which is different from bragging. Bragging is a different world there, and there's a way to do it right. We can have a separate conversation about that another mm. time. Call me if you need to talk about that. Right. But do recognize military or otherwise, if you want a leadership role, you need to advocate. It's okay Thank to you. sell yourself. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Again, not salesy, right yeah. way and the wrong way to do it, but you have to do it Correct. one way or another. Finally, Ralph, if you were asked to give the commencement address at a high school graduation ceremony, what advice would you give the graduates, whether or not they're going to go to college, enter the military, or do anything else, uh, regardless of where they want to go with their careers? What's the one thing they have to do to be successful? Only one? Yep. Uh, I, I can narrow it down to a couple. One is I ask <laughs> them to take every opportunity to lead, mm. find opportunities to lead. I also ask them to take prudent risks. It's get outside your comfort zone, get outside the box. Uh, in my world, it was, uh, I was afraid of heights. So mm. what do I do? I go into the flying game. It's okay to take prudent risks. Uh, and I think that's the only way you're going to push the bounds of, of what you can do and to find out what you're truly made of. And then I also tell them, whatever you do, just have some fun. You know, it's a lot more uh, entertaining that, that, uh, that you get into work or your day-to-day -day stuff with a good positive mindset. That's great. That, and I love that there's, you use phrases like prudent risks. And then we've talked about taking one step and taking first steps. And you're like, well, I'm afraid of heights. So I think I'll go in the Air Force and fly. And did you have to jump out of planes too as part of that? Was that part of the training, I assume? I didn't tell anybody to follow my advice. I just, <laughs> I'm just really good at giving advice. <laughs> Well, you certainly followed your own, that's for sure, yeah. and, and uh, went to sort of do not pass go, do not collect $200, yeah. do not just take the small step, just launch right into facing those fears. That's, yeah, that's so. inspiring, to say the least. <laughs> Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today. How can people learn more about you, about JDog Foundation, and, and those veteran services, perhaps? Uh, JDogFoundation.org is a good place to go. Uh, you can go to RalphGalati.com. <clears> that just shows a little bit of my public speaking capabilities. Uh, or you could always contact me through that website if you have some issues about how to help veterans or taking the next step in your community. So ralphgalati.com is a good place to go. Terrific. Thank you once again for your service uh, to our country and for your service to our listeners today. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Laura. And to everybody else, thank you for listening. As always, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thank you for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.